Welcome to the Forbes Business School video interview series. I'm here with at the European School of Management and Technology, ESMT Berlin, with Professor Matt Blockner. Uh, Matt, it's great to see you. Thank you. Great to be here with you. Now, your re research here at the Business School covers many things. It's status, from the boardroom to the sports field. Can you explain a little bit what you've been working on? Well, the most recent uh, paper with some co-authors at NCAD, KAIST, and U.S. Treasury is on the consequences of status similarity. So w what happens on the racetrack when two Formula One drivers have beaten roughly the same drivers and have lost to the same, to the same drivers? And, and what we find, um, ad adjusting statistically for spatial proximity on the track, is that the closer they are together, the more likely they are to collide. And we see this as a test of um, a, a really elegant book that the late Roger Gould wrote called Collision of Wills. He's got a chapter called Strife Out of Symmetry in the book. And his basic story is that when two individuals are ambiguous with regard to who has more status, they then really can't decide who should defer to whom. That can lead to escalations into fratricide, homicide, um, angry words at a minimum, all, all sorts of, um, of negative outcomes. And so we're seeing that drivers collide with greater frequency when their status similar, but we're seeing evidence of, of real similarity in, in status in, in a competitive domain driving aggressive behavior. And, and how does this idea of status similarity um, play out in, in the boardroom, for example? I think that the boardroom is a great case where one could be caught unawares by the, uh, the subtle temptations that go with status similarity. So if you and I are on the board together, I might be leading one part of the company, you another, and we can't quite figure out who is more of an alpha, let's say, in this room. I expect you to defer to me, you expect me to defer to you, and we can't agree. Uh, that might be a situation in which there is a blow up that both of us regret. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, a, there's an underlying lesson here, which is to be sensitive to those subtle but very real social conditions that can give rise to a desire to attack. Right. Now you've also talked about um, status and how it affects performance. Yes. Yes, so the work on status and performance um, is work with, with Ned Smith at, at Kellogg and Young Q Kim at Korea University. This looks at the performance-related consequences of status in two sports, actually, professional golf and NASCAR, uh, the American equivalent of, of Formula One. And there we see that uh, at very high levels of status, the, the golfers do worse and the NASCAR drivers drive more slowly. And so there's some initial evidence of um, complacency and distraction going with high status. I mean, typically we think of status as a great thing. It makes you feel good, it lowers your cost of influence, it makes it easier for you to get all sorts of good things, but there could be corrupting influences that are, are at work meaningfully amongst those who occupy high status positions if they're not aware of those potential sources of corruption. And, and this is what you describe as the dark side of status? Yeah, this is the dark side. Okay. Yes, I mean, it, I mean, the way research in network analysis starts is that typically there's someone who says, here's a, a network position, like a status position, or a, uh, a position where someone's, someone is a broker between groups, and the work begins with how that position is beneficial to you. But then as, as the work starts to accumulate, uh, there's always interest in the dark side of what someone initially thought was a great competitive advantage. Right. Th there's a brighter side, presumably in a, in a pool of financial analysts, young consultants, engineers. Yeah. Um, how can you be conscious of um, status and perhaps even through mentors, you know, rise up in the pecking order? Okay. Well, the, let's let's deal with this question first. Um, how how do you become conscious of status? And this is a, a tip that I learned uh, from w one of my co-authors, Joel Padoni, who is uh, now at Apple Computer. I, I think fr he has the, um, one of the best insights of how you know who has status if you walk into a room and you don't know anyone. And what he, says, what he suggested was that you know the person has status if he tells a completely lame joke and then everyone laughs. You're, you're laughing slightly, which is not good for either of us right now. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I think that, that when, there's, when there's a joke told with no humor value, and you hear a, a ripple of laughter, that's a signal that the person has status. So that's like a simple rule of thumb. How would you know who has status if you know no one? Um, 
Now, status more generally is something you can actually see pretty quickly. You can see it when there is, uh, well, well, let me put it this way. You can see it when there are gestures of respect uh, flowing at someone from people who are themselves respected. That, that's essentially what status is without going into the underlying mathematics, is that you're highly regarded by others who are highly regarded. And you can see the kind of circularity in that definition, which is why status is often measured as an infinite sum. So, so there's this sort of halo effect, yes. perhaps, of a, of a well-chosen mentor. Right, right. And that halo can rub off on you from someone else. All, and what's interesting um, is that sometimes the halo that you give to someone else can grease their way so well that they end up surpassing you, at least momentarily, in status. So, I mean, think, think back to Steve Jobs approaching Scully, who was working for uh, Pepsi at the time, and, and asking him, would you like to sell sugar water for the rest of your life, or come with me and change the world? And Scully, of course, went with Jobs, but the halo of Jobs did rub off on Scully. Uh, Scully was able to benefit from that, and in a, in a relatively short moment of time, Jobs was forced out. Now, I, I don't think we want to say that everything Scully accomplished, which was a lot, was simply due to Jobs' status. We have to be fair to Scully as well. But the point is that there can be situations in which that halo is um, something, when passed to another, can hurt the person who passed it on to begin with. So here at ESMT, uh, of course, the, the MBA students are a part of uh, a growing network. Um, would you have any advice for them in terms of how to um, stand out from the crowd? How to stand out from the crowd? Um, yes, I, I think it would be a simple lesson, which is to, or, or simple principle, which is to give more than you take. Uh, sociologists, at least since uh, Guldner's work mid-century, have been very interested in the reciprocity norm, which basically says that you know if I give something to you, uh, you will reciprocate in some way. It's just part of the human condition. And I think the failure path in networking is to go out and you know, try to, as artfully as you can, take. I think if you uh, build a network in a more authentic way, which is simply to, to give and uh, create value where you can, not being distracted. I mean, not every need is a, is a, is a calling in Max Weber's sense, but uh, giving where you can authentically, I think, will build a reputation or, in my language, status a lot faster than the typical uh, networking techniques, which a any intelligent person, I think, can see through rather quickly. Well, Matt, it's, it's been a pleasure. Th thank you very much for your time. Thank you.